Hi, and welcome to this live stream on Webpian Academy. Uh, as you know, my name is Antonella Di Giulio, and I'm the founder of uh, Webpian Academy. I create all the contents, uh, and uh, I have some people helping me. But this live streams uh, are specifically for whoever would like to know more about music as a profession and music as a career. And uh, today we have, uh, as a guest, uh, uh, Dr. Fabiana Clorer, who is a pianist, but also a sort of business strategist. So she um, helps musicians uh, uh, find uh, their businesses uh, uh, through their creativity and through their kind of uh, creative job as musicians. So I will add now, uh, Dr. Fabiana Clore to the stream and we can go from there. Um, hi and welcome to European Academy. I'm so glad that you find the time to be with us uh, today. Um, so uh, tell us a, a little bit uh, about, uh, you know, who you are and how uh, did you end up uh, taking care of musicians uh, as business owners? <laughs> because we don't think about musicians being able to do businesses, right? Right, absolutely. I know I certainly didn't as I was becoming a pianist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was not top of mind for sure. Well, I'm a pianist, as Dr. Antonella just has shared, um, and I'm also a business strategist for musicians. And for most of my life, I focused on becoming the best musician that I could. I pursued you know, all my degrees in piano performance, culminating in my doctorate degree in piano performance. And up until the very, very last two years of my education, it never occurred to me that I needed to learn about the business side of music. I just figured right. somehow things would work themselves out as long as I was, the, you know, trying to strive for achieving excellence as an artist and as a teacher. Yes. Um, but really to, throughout the uh, second half of my doctorate degree, I was at the University of Miami, which has a very, very strong business program for musicians, a music business yeah. program. And I decided to start just looking into those courses. And I fell in love with the idea uh, and the similarities between entrepreneurship and music. And so I really just went all in and started learning and researching and discovering how many musicians had been entrepreneurs. And in fact, I don't know if you all know this, but the earliest definition of an entrepreneur from the Oxford English Dictionary in 1897 defines an entrepreneur as one who creates musical performances. Wow. Because even I... since the you know, 19th century, entrepreneurs okay. were associated with artists because musicians had to do everything to make their music uh, right. it, oh, let's think yeah. back at uh, um, the recitals, uh, you know, the like a recital form was created by Liszt yeah. and uh, or Hannon uh, invented this, you know, the virtuoso pianist just because he was an entrepreneur and then he obviously wanted to sell his books and create uh, uh, some of the news, right? Not yes. Just... And, you know, Chopin would sell tickets from his home and Mozart had to do the fundraising and the writing right. and the composition and performing uh, himself. And it was part of being a musician, you know, yes. historically, only in the early you know, 20th century when the rise of managers started to come into play and the, more of the industrialization of performers uh, where there was this difference, right, between like the performers and the people who manage the performers, mm -hmm. that it started to become separate. But until then, musicians had to be entrepreneurial in order right. to survive. Yeah. And so when I started realizing that this is actually an integral part of musicians, it's not something foreign. Business mm -hmm. is not something foreign. Uh, I really fell in love with the idea and I knew I needed to learn not only for my own survival and success and thriving in my career, but also to be able to spread the information with so many musicians who were completely unaware of truly the challenges that musicians face after coming out of academia, after finishing school. Right. These things are not really part of the normal educational system. This is not what musicians are taught. The focus is generally to achieve excellence, to become the best performer uh, and expect the rest to kind of fall into play. And that's a true disservice that I discovered was happening in the academic 
uh, system and the educational system. So I created a dissertation around the topic of entrepreneurial concert pianists and really researching what are the trends that allow musicians, pianists to create performing careers while also running their own ventures. And that began the beginning stepping stone of me just jumping into entrepreneurship head on. My husband, who's also a concert pianist, uh, we were both doing our doctorates together. So this was a very important thing because the two of us had to figure this out, right? It wasn't like we right, could just right, right. on yeah. each other. Like this was it. There was no safety net. So yeah. we uh, we started really asking ourselves, you know, what are our options when we finish school? What what are we going to do? How can we figure out the best path for our career, given everything we've done? And truly the idea of just making our own business mm -hmm. started to feel like it was the most tangible option. Because up until that point, we were expecting maybe to just apply for college jobs and hope that we were just going to get a teaching job at yeah. a university and somehow someone yeah. was going to hire us, you know, but right. And you know what it is uh, that I felt in my, like I had the same experience and uh, uh, I consider myself an entrepreneur more than, uh, uh, you know, somebody who would be willing to work in a university and just, it, it is just the independence that, and the freedom that that gives to you. I'm not, like fearing that, I mean, we don't have funds in the academia and then I will have no job tomorrow. I don't fear that because I have my own things. I have my own resources. I have my own several streams of incomes. And, uh, and then through that, I create my own security and I feel safe that if even one student won't come one day, I still have seven other streams of income that I can count on to survive and thrive instead of being dependent um, of somebody else's will and wishes. <laughs> I have the, my own freedom to create what uh, I would like to give and to, you know, it's a, a way of serving the world in a kind of in your own way with your own creativity instead of you know, being dependent on whatever curriculum is going on in uh, a music department, uh, for example. Yeah. Yes, and, uh, you know, this is something that in many ways is very foreign to the way musicians are trained. Uh, and yes. it's actually in many ways the opposite, because if you think about our educational system and the idea of standards of grading, standards yes. of achievement, we're you know doing examinations, we're trying to fit into a mold, we're trying to conform to some standards that have been established for us in terms of what represents this level of achievement versus the next level of achievement. So all throughout our training, we're taught that we need to fit in and conform to the norm, right? Yes. We need to meet the standards. We need to do the things, hopefully, as the everyone else so that we can be approved and promoted into the next level. And I understand the rationale for that, because, of course, when you're in musical development, there needs to be a milestone sequence of where are you in order to get to the next level. I mean, I'm also an examiner for the Royal Conservatory of Music. Yeah. And I went through two years of training. Even after I got my doctorate degree, I still had to go through the two years of training to become an examiner and to understand the different standards of excellence and, and grading. And so I get it in terms of musical development. However, for business development, it's totally the opposite. Right. This is yeah. development. It's about standing out. It's about holding on to your uniqueness and trying to hold on to that sense of worthiness, that sense of power and authority and showing it to the world. And if you're different, it's actually good, right? Yeah. You're not, you're not, you don't want to be the same as everyone else because you get buried in it and then you don't stand out, right? right. So it's actually yeah. a very different mentality. Uh, so I really enjoyed kind of learning through and understanding how to really position myself and my, my, my career. And when my, we had the idea with my husband of building a music school, we just went all in. And fortunately, yeah. the university had a program that was a mentorship program for a business. Uh, yeah. And so they helped us, they supported us, and we were able to create our school while still finishing our doctorate degrees. Uh, and now it's been 11 years that we've been running the school. It's called Superior Academy of Music. Uh, and it's in Miami, Florida. We were finishing in, in the university there. We opened it right there. Uh, okay. And after five years of running the school and starting the program and really going through this avalanche of lessons from being 100% pianists to learning into becoming business owners and not just any business, but like a business where we were giving absolutely everything. We leased a commercial yeah. space in a mall. We signed a lease. We 
we you know invested all the money that we had and in like got into debt we got uh, you know investors also we asked for friends family like we did everything we put everything into this venture there was no backup plan there was no you know eh, if it doesn't work out well no 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 this had to work out uh, right. and so we went into this pr- process really head on and it, it was a learning journey it continues to be but after five years of running the school I also became a mom and I started to really wonder what else is there for me to do you know I learned how to create a music school our students were winning music uh, co- you know competitions they were entering universities with full scholarships they were getting great recognition our school was featured on PBS twice wow. it was just a series of milestones that I felt I had met, but I knew that there was more that I could do, that I could serve at a greater capacity. And the opportunity to move to Texas kind of fell on my lap through an email that I got. And they wanted someone to come and build the university program for musicians and help Mm -hmm. musicians understand about the business of music and entrepreneurship. And so that sounded like a fantastic opportunity. And I was super excited to be able to do it. And then, of course, my husband was like, what are we going to do with our school if you get this job? You know, right. and I really never applied to a job at the university because, as I mentioned before, we just decided let's just do our own thing. Let's create our own business. Let's, let's embrace this opportunity. Let's go all in. Uh, and at least we feel we're building something that's somewhat within our control versus mm-hmm. just waiting for someone to pick us. Right. Yeah. In fact, we actually hired many of our colleagues who were graduating from the doctoral program without any job. So we actually were able to not only provide ourselves with income, but also our, our peers. Um, but but is everything, you know, there's seasons for everything. And so right. the opportunity to come into university position and build a program was really exciting to me. Uh, so we moved to, to Texas and my husband took the reins of the school and we had to restructure it so that it could continue running with, without us there. And that was a huge adventure and a learning curve. And for the first year, year and a half, it was a lot of stress just right. figuring out how to run a business without us. But I will tell you, it was one of the most important lessons that I learned and that I quickly decided to turn into like my main signature teaching philosophy, which is as musicians, we should strive not only to create businesses, but to do it in a way where they don't depend on us for every right. single aspect of it, where we yeah. can create system structure. Yeah, them. because when when you when you uh, have uh, that one business in which you are required to be there, you're basically trading your time for money, and uh, instead of just uh, opening up uh, to you know more possibilities, and that's what a business owner should do. Actually, if I just work. Uh, you know, one-on-one with the lessons. Yeah, but I'm not creating really a business. I'm just giving a lesson and that lesson might disappear. Instead, the, what you did was just to open up and, and to give the freedom. And you can just franchise that. You can sell it. You can just, you know, open more schools if you want to because that the system works without you being present. And obviously, if you open a franchise, you can be present in all the all the schools that you own and that's that's uh, that's a, a good thing about the business right yeah um, and you know the thing about it though is that i never thought that one day i would be delegating it in this way you know when i started the business it never occurred to me that one day i could be running it like i'm running it now if i would have started the business with that mentality of like mm-hmm. how can i build this business so that it can potentially run without me in a ways at some point Oh my gosh, I would have done so many things differently. You know what I mean? I would have been yeah. systematizing everything from day one, looking for ways to create more leverage, saving so much time and money and things that were unnecessary that I was just dragging myself and going through. So I spent, you know, the first five years working like three times harder than I yeah. needed, just because it never occurred to me that I would one day like delegate it. So when life kind of gave me this opportunity at that point, I was like, how can I make this happen? And then with my husband, we had to brainstorm and we did. And then ironically, you know, after like two or three years, we realized the business was more profitable without us there than when we were there both full time. (laughs) Yeah, not because you weren't there. I mean, because the system was changing. And we were always joking, like the best thing we could have done for our school is to leave it. Like we always joke about that because when you get to work on your business versus in your business, You have a different perspective. You're not so overwhelmed, burned out, tired, uh, and just just exhausted from doing everything, you know? So you get to see things differently and make better decisions. Um, So that's what I discovered was my biggest takeaway is like, wow, like what would it be if I could help musicians now from day one 
<laughs> build their businesses with that exit strategy in mind. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, I was uh, listening to somebody. Um, I, I don't know you, if you uh, follow that uh, show, um, Undercover Billionaire. Uh, but, oh, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Grant Cardone I, 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 one of the episodes there, right? I, 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 yeah. But uh, in the first series, in the first season, um, uh, um, I don't remember his name, but uh, uh, he said the, the 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 main character in the, in the show said that uh, in order to create his business, he has learned uh, that he has to delegate more than doing by himself. He said, that if there is somebody who can do those things better than me, I prefer them to do that and me to run the business from the outside and to organize everything and let other people do what what is their best uh, instead of me running every single aspect of the business. And that's uh, that's probably kind of a very good advice, right? So if I'm not good at marketing, why should I do that? I mean, just pay and let somebody else do that and have the results that they can. Yes, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. But it's a challenge because as creatives, we like to learn a lot. Right? I found myself many, many times, uh, especially in the early years uh, of, my, of my first business and my husband too, just learning, you know, and thinking, oh, I can do this. I just have to learn. So I'm just going to start watching some videos. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And my CPA, for example, my husband did the books for our economy for the first like three years or something or four years. And our CPA would be like, why? You guys are pianists. You should not be doing your books. Please, every time you send me your books, it's such a nightmare. I have to work three times as hard. Just get yourself a bookkeeper. And for us, we were like, well, but we can just, you know, go here and learn about yeah. this and this and that. And so we tend to be very um, kind of shiny, bright object syndrome, right? It's like, oh, I'll just learn about this. Oh, let me just go and learn how to edit this video and learn how to do this thing. And so I see this happen and so often with my clients who I give them some strategies to free up their time and to figure out what their North Star is. But oftentimes, even when they free up their time, then they go and they start using it in things that don't matter. Right. And they're like, oh, now I have an assistant. I'm so relieved. I'm not doing a lot of my administrative work anymore. My assistant is helping me. So I'm taking this course on video editing and I'm just going to learn how to edit video. And I'm like, but why? You're a piano teacher. You should be focusing on, you know, teaching piano, creating your content, yeah, yeah, building yeah. awareness, being the face of the brand, attracting clients to your online studio. Yeah. Not editing video. That's not gonna. Like, I tell you. I tell you. I tell you a thing. Uh, I my son, my little one. He's uh, twelve, and uh, he has his own YouTube channel. He's doing his own things. Wow. He, he posts funny videos about politics, social media, social studies, and history, historical content most of the time. And uh, his channel grew, uh, and, and you know, we have channels as we know that how hard it is to grow a channel. In three months, uh, he got 12,000 subscribers to that wow. channel, which is a lot for a 12 years old. And most of the people on his channel, I don't think they know that he's 12. But <laughs> because he doesn't appear in the videos, they are faceless. So really he just video his video editing. So my with my channel, uh, I said, you know what, Priamo, uh, mom has this channel. I want that to grow. And you're posting so many shorts. I don't have the time to do that. I, I'm paying you. You do that for me. And you post the shorts on my channel because I really don't don't have the knowledge for that. He's expert in Google Trends and looking at it. I mean, how much time should I spend in looking at all the short videos? If he's already doing that, why don't, uh, you know, why don't let you do that uh, instead of you know me jumping in and doing all the contents and all the things for for my um, you know uh, uh, YouTube channel for my uh, social media presence? So, so I gave him uh, the job to create those things for me, and he's doing a great job. I mean, and I'm happy for that. Uh, so and then many times we miss to see these opportunities. I could have seen him doing the shorts and say, oh, how do you do that? Let me do that. But then it cost exactly. me two hours of my time to do a short, uh, to produce a short every day. And I can spend this two hours practicing maybe or doing something else. So uh, organizing things from the outside instead of just actually doing things that for him, it takes him uh, maybe 10 minutes to produce that. And for me, it would be, you know, something out of my comfort zone. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, that's that's what we do. That's what we do. Yes. 
And it takes, a, you know, also a decision to be okay with relinquishing, relinquishing control, like letting go of the control, especially when we're building something that we really are passionate about, we care about. Um, we're not willing to hand it off to others and see that they don't do it at the same level that we could do it, yes. right? We're like, gosh, like if I just do it myself, I'm going like, to get it done so quickly and I'll, I'll get it, like I'll just do it the way I want it to be. Yeah. And it's about recognizing that as long as we hold on to that mentality, we're never going to grow. We need yeah. to be able to step out and say, I really like, like this is something I'm doing really well, but I should step out so that I can focus on, you know, more strategic analysis, thinking, visioning, you know, all the things that I need to do as a, as a, as a like visionary leader, right? So I need to break down the systems. How do I do this? And I need to be not only willing to offload it to someone else, but to coach that other person right. and to be okay when they initially don't meet the standards and they fall short. And we're like, oh, you just missed this opportunity or you didn't do this right. But instead of like, never mind, let me just give it back and I'll just, just keep doing it myself, which is what happens all the time to say, no, like this needs to be created. I need to improve the way I teach this. My person needs to improve the way they learn it. And I have to be okay with coaching them through its success versus right. expecting someone to just be able to do it from the beginning like I do. And so many entrepreneurs get caught up in that paradigm. They don't want to release control. So I think that's also one of the most important things is yeah. understanding that it's worth it in the end. Yes. And so, so you, you moved to Texas, you started, uh, um, you know, teaching in university, this, uh, or you, you built up basically your uh, uh, what was a music business uh, yes program? yes and um and, and so and, and now but now you're doing something else yes so yes. after four years of running the program and really building in a way a business inside a university because it was from the ground up everything had to be done from scratch uh right. and having really great results seeing our our students start building their own businesses in school just like i did creating their own, uh, you know, nonprofit organizations, their for-profit brick and mortar st schools, everything it was just so rewarding. And I felt uh, after about four years into it, I started to feel that same urge of like, I bet that there's more that I can do and impact musicians, not just in the context of the university I'm teaching right here in Denton, Texas, but around okay. the world. Right. And I also felt capped from an income standpoint. I felt that I was working really, really hard day in and day out in the program. Mm -hmm. and yet the income opportunities were really, really like, capped. There wasn't projections for me to be able to grow, you know? Yeah. And so I felt, I felt like there was something out of balance. And from having been an entrepreneur before, you know, and having had my, in my school, um, even though a brick and mortar business is not as volatile and scalable and growth sensitive as an online business is mm -hmm. I still was used to having more of an autonomy over my income right uh, and yeah. so I started to feel like like something was missing from an yeah income it, it feels to... almost uh, that the more you work then uh, uh, so you don't really increase your income it's just At like all. the more you work it's just the same exactly. and then so they, they if you were used to that before your lack of motivation will come right after right yeah, uh, and there were other it. things that motivated me like it wasn't yeah. i wasn't really in it for the income mm -hmm. uh, i was in it for the challenge for the experience right. for the environment for just doing something new you know what i mean mm -hmm. and growing yeah. um but then i felt like okay i i i like i'm ready for more and i know that there's more out there so I started to really explore how could I position myself as an online business? How could I now build a brand umbrella uh, based on everything that I've learned, based on what my, you know, my experience as a, as a concert pianist, right. experience as a piano teacher, as an entrepreneur, as a university educator? How could I just put it all under one umbrella and build that as an online business? And so that's when the idea of the musician's profit umbrella came to me. <laughs> that wow like i have all of this expertise i just need to right. package it in a way that people can work with me online and right. so i started positioning myself and sharing with people that i was going to be now branching out and expanding my services uh, and i launched my first program in june of 2020 just a few months after the pandemic hit uh, and i exceeded my yearly university salary by 120 percent wow one program launch 
I was just like, how is this possible that I could create this type of financial uh, prosperity and abundance so quickly and without having to work so hard like I've been working in my university? Right. So yeah. I started to just experiment and continue tweaking it. And there were moments where, you know, things grew and there were moments where things dried up as I continued testing and experimenting and optimizing my curriculum, redefining who my ideal clients were, how I was going to serve, raising my rates. Everything started to kind of morph and start developing. Yeah. But after like a year of juggling both, having my university job as well as the program I was building, I really started to feel completely burned out. I was just like, this is just too much. Yeah. You know, I was holding on and I just decided, you know, like if I need, if I really am going to do this online business with my full alignment and integrity, which was all really about helping musicians build a business without burnout, build a right. business that can work without them, build a business that wouldn't require them to sacrifice any aspect of their life, their family life, their quality of life, their yeah. health. I was like, why am I burning myself out? Like there's a, there's a, there's a dissonance happening. So I made the very, very bold move of quitting my full-time university job, much to the shock of most of my colleagues who, as you know, you know, most musicians are trained to right. want that job. Only. To want that. And to only expect that. I remember, I, I can tell you something. I, I remember uh, I, I was working at university and uh, my colleague uh, who was retiring, I was part-time there. So my colleague was retiring. It was a piano company. So he told me, Oh, when I'm retiring, this would be your job. And I was like, oh. <laughs> almost like scared. I'm like, I don't want to be here until I retire. <laughs> you know, it was like that kind of uh, um, uh, reality check. I really don't want this for my entire life. I don't want to be here and accompany students over and over and over again forever because that's not who I am. I don't want to do that for him. But, uh, but for him, that was normal. It was trained to accept that as his existence and not wanting anything more. And I think musicians do really deserve a little bit more than just like being out there and looking for random possibilities uh, um, because it's not, not fair towards them, towards the amount of time that they put into the instrument uh, and into learning music. Uh, it's just yeah. like, yeah. Yes. So it was a really bold choice. But and let me tell you, at the time that I quit, it's not like I had this security on my business or any of that. I had three clients at that time. But I knew like if I really am going to go forward and I had seen the potential from my first yeah. program launch. Right, right, right. So I was like, I know I can do this. I already did it. And if I really go into it fully without anything that is holding my energy down or capping my potential, like, I have no choice but to be successful. This has to work out. But it was terrifying. I will tell you. It's not something that, you know, I was like, oh, it's all just going to work out. I, I knew I was taking a bold move, you know, uh, letting go of a full-time salary, tenure track position, benefits, you know, the name of the game, how everything goes. Um, so I just decided that I wanted to model what I believe is possible for musicians, you yeah. know, and to just show them by my own journey what I, what I teach and what I believe in. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful for that because entrepreneurship is not for the faint of heart, as you know. Yeah. Entrepreneurship yeah. requires a, a personality. It's not for everyone. It, it requires yeah. a way of seeing things. It requires a perspective, a willingness to take risk mm -hmm. and a willingness to fail and to be able to stand up and recover when you do. And right. so I realized, you know, I... I want to give myself that chance. And I wasn't sure whether it was going to work out or not. But I, what I was sure is that I was not going to continue hustling my way through life. I did have, I had nothing to prove at that point. I had achieved so many financial and, and you know, professional milestones. And I was like, why am I working so hard? Who am I trying to like prove? What, what is this thing? Like, no, right. I need to have a life. I have two sons, a three-year-old, an eight-year-old. At that time, I, you know, it, and I, and I'm like, no, I want to be able to focus on what matters. I want to continue performing and playing and not being mm -hmm. so burned out. So that was my kind of final trigger that pushed me in, into what has been now the last year of me diving full in into my online coaching practice and really helping musicians all around the world do what I did, build their businesses, create an online brand, package their skills under an umbrella that allows them to create profit, but to do it without sacrificing their quality of life. 
Wonderful. So if somebody would like to work with you or get in touch with you, how would it work? So that, so that we, you know, if somebody is listening to this uh, live stream, they would just like, uh, and they are curious about uh, what is your offering. How, how could they start getting to that? Yeah, my website, fabianaclore.com is the best way for people to reach me. I have actually a great training on my website. If you land on the page, you can see it there, but it's also on a URL that is it's with a gift. So it's fabianaclore.com forward slash gift. I will, add, uh, I will add that in the description. Oh, great. The this is a great training that gives musicians like the 10 basic foundational steps to start building their online brands. Uh, and I walk them through the most important pieces that they need to keep in mind and give them an overview of what it's like to build an online business like I have uh, and how I help my clients and what I do with them in that capacity. There's a handout to fill out to go along the training. And I think it's really helpful to give that more granular step-by-step -step framework on how to start packaging your skills. So if you visit my website and you go to fabianaclora.com forward slash gift, that's a great resource for anyone who's curious about like, this all sounds good, but how do I actually get started? That would be a great a great place. I also have a Facebook group, a community that I nurture and present free live trainings every week. It's called Musicians Creating Prosperity. Uh, so you can also put the link. I'll send you the link there to, yeah. to link here under the show. But yes, I'm, I'm constantly creating content uh, in, a, in our community to help elevate the consciousness of musicians and awareness of musicians and really share what's possible for them in a new way. Yeah, that's awesome. As I, I always the experience uh, that uh, whenever somebody is performing, they don't really know how to organize the performances, how to, you know, I don't have an agent, so nobody's doing that for me. How do I do that? Maybe even, even I think musicians in pop music, they are more aware of that than oh, yeah. classical musicians. Because oh, my are, gosh. You're just oh. used to, you know, you, know, you have to go have a competition, win the competition, and, you know, then hope that somebody will invite you oh okay so somebody will take care of that but we are not trained to actually create our own uh, authority in whatever field we want to be and then there are a lot of options i mean somebody might be uh, specializing in baroque music somebody else might might love to play i don't know contemporary music but that, that has to be then presented in uh put together in a way that it is attractive to whoever uh, your audience uh, will be at one point. And that's what we miss as uh, classical musicians, especially. Um, yeah. So uh, could you just give some advices, uh, uh, you know, besides, uh, you know, looking at your uh, website, some advices to somebody who would just like to, um, go that way so to become an entrepreneur in music um so what would you tell them if they are for example starting a starting the university or studying in a university as classical performers yeah so one of the things that i love starting the process when i help my clients really start packaging themselves online is to focus on their story our story is the main part of the business. It's the foundation after which everything else that we do will build upon building a business. But without an understanding of who you are, what have you overcome in your life? What are some of the challenges you've had to overcome? And what are the lessons that you learn from those challenges? And how have these lessons influenced your perspective now? in the work that you do, whether you teach in an instrument, whether you perform, whether you're a curator, you like to organize things for people, put festivals together, whatever it is that you do, there's a reason why you chose that versus everything else you could have done. Mm -hmm. And so I like helping musicians not focus so much on their current skill sets and think that they need to position themselves online based on their chops, based on what they know how to do, right. based on their area of expertise which puts a lot of pressure, by the way, on musicians, yeah. makes them feel imposter and feel like they're not worthy and feel that they still need to do X, Y, Z before they can do that. I like to break down those walls and really make, make our musicians realize that you already are remarkable. You already are worthy. You don't need someone to give you that permission to stand out in your authority. Who you are right now is already a wealth of experiences of, of, right. of 
insights of inspiration that can create so much impact into the world. And as long as you're willing to look inward first and not expect your outer reality to give you that happiness, not expect the, the, the responses from people, the demand, the perceived demand or lack of demand for your work, not let the outside reality define who you are internally, but instead look at yourself first and foremost, explore your list, your assets, like put a list together. You know, I have an exercise that I share with my clients called your declaration of awesomeness. Like write down the 10 things that you feel have defined you in some way, shape or form. And they're not always going to be good things. They may be bad things, but that, you know, you have grown and, and elevated yourself through those experiences, write them down, create a list. What are those 10 critical defining things that you feel have made you who you are and have influenced your perception and your perspective and your passions right now? And then start asking yourself who could benefit from these skills? Like who would be the ideal type of client that you know could benefit from what you've learned? Usually, if you look at who you were maybe mm -hmm. five, 10 years ago, that's going to be the answer because chances are 95% of the time we build businesses out of things we've had to overcome and things we've had to learn by force right. because no one gave us a solution. So yeah. it really can be a very easy process if you simply reflect on who you were five years ago. You know, Can you envision there are more people right now in that position? If the mm -hmm. answer is yes, bingo. That's already an, a foundational element. You know your story, you know who your ideal clients potentially could be. And the other thing is, have people already been coming to you? Like I found that happens a lot. You already have a brand. We all have a brand, even if we haven't set out to create it. People already associate us with certain things, right? right. So most of the times, if you just reflect on the people who've been coming to you already informally, you know, and just asking for advice or can you tell me about this? I'm sure Antonella, you must have people who come and ask you about like creating a live stream online and building an online piano academy. Oh, wait, uh, so, uh, by the way, so that uh, I did uh, because of those live streams, uh, um, I uh, conducted some live streams for Tombase this past uh, um, summer. And it was all kind of such a, a, a almost a coincidence because I'm doing my live streams here on my own channel and uh, they were interested in some live streams as well. And then that's what I did it. And th that's probably, you know, that's, that's what you, what you're already doing is already your business. Who you already are is already your business. And then you just need to pack it that yeah, kind of exactly. a, you know, from, from, from a, a kind of a, a frame and put it in a frame and say, okay, so this is what I'm doing. And uh, at times we get lost and say, okay, I'm doing this, but I'm also doing this. I don't know who I am, right? Yes, I yes. I, I read a sentence in a book. Uh, uh, the book is, uh, I don't know if you know that book, it's uh, Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty. And uh, he starts uh, one of his chapters exactly with the sentence uh, or with the exercise that you were talking about. Uh, he says, he mentions somebody, I don't remember who, uh, who is the, uh, who is quoting, but uh, he says, we often think of ourselves that we are who somebody else, um, or who we think somebody else is thinking we are. It, it might be complicated, but if you are thinking, if I think that you are thinking I'm a failure, I think that I am a failure just because I'm thinking that you are thinking, but you're not thinking any of this. And just, just because of my perception of, uh, what you are thinking and then often we let ourselves influenced by those thoughts you know, about ourselves and you know what is the audience thinking what uh, what are those people thinking what are my clients thinking about me and then we let that influence who we are and we think that's who we are actually and that's yeah. not true though that's yes, not true exactly yeah. exactly yeah. so that's such a great great story because yes it's almost like we just need to get out of our own way. Yeah. We need to get out of our own way and allow our, our, you know, our ourselves, our story, just shine, you know. And it's not going to be for everyone, and that's okay. There will be some people who are going to listen to your story and are going to be like, "Oh my gosh, this so connects with me. I can, I resonate with this, right? I, I, okay. I feel you. I'm, I find myself in that situation too. Like, yes, 
there may be other people who are like, well, I don't really care about your story. I'm going to move on. And being okay, like completely unattached with the outcomes is also very important in this process because you yeah. don't have to appeal to everyone. You don't. And it's okay if you don't. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. So, uh, Fabiana, I know that you have to go in uh, about 10 minutes. Uh, so, uh, some final thoughts about, uh, um, I don't know, music and business in general? Or... Yes. So, one of the things that I think I'm so passionate about sharing with musicians is stop trading your time for money. Stop trading your time for money. Do not price your services based on how much time you spend with people. And this is probably going to go against what most of, you know, most of you have ever understood or heard in terms of the way you teach online, you teach uh, your lessons. But if you teach per hour, you know, if you have a model that is based on your time and you give away all your time, like you, you, you reach, well, I don't know, 30, 40 students a week, you have no more opportunities to grow because you've just given away all your time. So everything that you create needs to be based on value based on the result that you can provide based on the information that's going to be given to your clients and the transformation they can count on not on how much time you're spending with that so what does that mean instead of teaching let's say we're going to meet once a week for four weeks a month right and for an hour each time create a program where you can perhaps group your students into some cohorts Maybe offer some one-on-one -on -one asynchronous components where they can send you maybe a video. You could give some feedback on that as a one-on-one -on -one experience, but not putting everybody in a one-on-one -on -one lesson. They don't need that. You don't need to work in that way, especially pianists, piano teachers. Explore how you could package your skills by having a result that you can say, this is what my program is going to help you achieve at, after, I don't know, six months, for example, small milestones at a time. And we're going to meet, let's say, once a week. We're going to have a group component. There's going to be maybe maybe once a week, month a one-on-one -on -one short, like 30-minute interaction and provide access to you outside of those opportunities. For example, a Facebook group where people can post questions and get support right. from you on an ongoing basis. Give yourself access, like allow people to access you, but not based on your time only. Make yeah, it so that people can access your intellect. They more based on the value that you provide to others so rather than on yeah. the exchange of time for money. Exactly. Because most of the time, uh, if the student would come to lesson and I, I have the experience in that, the students may be tired, uh, kind of sleepy. <laughs> I don't know if, I, if you talk about the younger students or kind of not feeling well that moment, then you know the, the, the minutes are kind of useless to that particular student. And instead, if I give access to different options, that student can take advantage of those options whenever they feel they can. And uh, it's more effective, of course. In the last two years, the online learning platform has been validated like never before. Right. You know, before 2020, this would have been a hard sell for me to say to your community. They would have been like, what, online? But since the pandemic, when everything turned online, like it's been like accepted by society. You know, people accept the fact that you can learn online and you can learn music online and it's possible. But yet so many musicians, all they did was repeat what they were doing in person and do it online. Right. Instead of redesigning the business model, creating a new way to serve their clients because of the online space, right? right? Yeah. So this is my call to action. It's like, this is one of the hills I'll die on really. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I really feel very passionate about sharing this message with musicians, especially pianists, piano teachers, because we give away too much of our energy and our time, and then we get sick, we get burned out, we get tired, our students don't appreciate us, we're underpaid, undervalued, and it doesn't have to be. You know, one of my clients yeah. started working with me, she was teaching cello online, and she was just so burned out and so exhausted. We packaged her business in a way that she could actually focus on the result, put it together in a six month program, priced it at $5,000 per student. And in three months, she launched her first group program, made $25,000 just with five clients. Why? Because she switched without right. or no longer trading that time for money and instead focusing on the value and the result. Yeah. So this is possible. You can do this. Musicians are doing mm -hmm. this. Yeah, that's awesome. So I 
thank you for your time here. Uh, and uh, I hope to, to have you, uh, you know, uh, in the future back uh, on this live stream, maybe with, uh, when, when you're launching something new or kind of uh, there's some, something new that, uh, that you're developing. Um, and I hope uh, many of my colleagues will get in touch with you and then uh, take advantage of this offer and this training uh, because it's very, very important, uh, especially um, in this period of time and especially today to kind of uh, develop new concepts and become uh, uh, more active uh, in what we see in our future. Um, yes, absolutely. And thank you for providing this wonderful space. I mean, we need this as a, as an industry, you know, as a community, musicians need platforms like the ones you're building here with your channel and your web piano Academy. I also want to just thank you for providing this space for all of us to be, be able to have these important conversations. This is a very important part of, of helping things improve in our industry and creating yes. the change is just having the opportunity to bring these conversations to light. So thank you so much for creating this. Thank you again for being with us. And uh, so I wish you a very, very nice day in Texas. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I will probably see you soon, but <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye.